So today, uh, Gospel of John chapter 6. Uh, so far we've studied, the, in chapter 6, we've just studied the disciples returning from their mission trips they had. They followed by their, their miraculous feeding of, of more than 5,000 people. Now we, we hear of Jesus feeding 5,000. It was actually the disciples. And you can look back a couple of weeks in our studies to see that. We see the people attempting to make Jesus their king. We saw Jesus walking on the water, come out to the boat, and how he calmed the sea. And uh, today we are continuing in that great adventure um, from the, in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, starting at verse 22. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So we ended at verse 26 for this uh, particular study. Uh, remember, the night before this, there was a terrible storm on the sea, kind of like last night here at the campground. <laughs> um, people, uh, this time, the pe this morning, people were looking for Jesus. They didn't know that he had actually taken off across the water by foot <laughs> after taking time to pray with his father and fellowship with his father. And um, they were, but they were here just like we are here this morning. They were looking for Jesus. And despite the storm, not knowing where, what Jesus was doing, they all came together looking for Jesus. And I thought that was kind of a cool, uh, we'll start our life lesson out today. First life lesson is, every morning, start the day looking for Jesus. Every day, start the morning, or excuse me, every morning, start the day looking for Jesus. Uh, ver, go back to verse 22. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other, other side of the sea saw there was no other boat there, except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. See, now, this was the people that had been fed over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It's also called Lake Gennesaret, a um, very popular place today in, in Israel. Uh, a lot of stuff going on there. But they knew that Jesus had not gotten into the same boat that the disciples got into. Uh, and these, these guys were paying attention. They were quite observant. Now, I, I gotta give you a little warning. I do rabbit trails, and here's another rabbit trail. Uh, these people weren't dumb or primitive, as many of our modern day people tend to think. Oh, these are th 2,000 years ago, they didn't know how to found, find their elbow. No, no, we don't give our ancestors and in ancient, in people in ancient times enough credit. Um, today, we've, we have accumulated, we've organized information, but that doesn't mean that we're smarter or more developed. Okay, um, as a whole, honestly, when, they, when you check it out really closely, humans are not as smart, talented, strong, or healthy today as they were back in Jesus' time. Uh, I don't think there's all that as much as they were back when I was a kid, you know? Um, and we see that we are not evolving towards perfection. You know, we didn't come from, you know, the goo and then end up at a zoo and then now it's you, you know, <laughs> as someone has said. Um, Adam and Eve, the first humans, Adam and Eve were as perfect as humans could possibly be, as, as they were. It was sin, it was sin that brought death into the world, it caused corruption at every level, in every generation. Uh, and, you know, we, we've got this proof now, you know, we've learned how to, how to work with DNA. Well, the DNA of each generation, they found it only amplifies the damaged DNA that we're passing along. So if, you know, two of you have the same damaged gene, you're going to produce another person that absolutely has that damaged gene. Um, I think we've seen this past year 
And on, on other areas, we've seen this past year how much damage can be done just because of circumstances in one year and how you know, people have had a lot of issues this last year. It doesn't take millions and millions of years for changes to take place in humans, in society, in, our, in our, ourselves. Um, the 6,000 or so years that the Bible records that we've been on the planet, that, that time is more than enough to account for all the changes that we've seen in our, in our lives, in our, in our uh, you know, in, in ourselves going, going downhill. But yes, sure, you know, people say, well, we're living longer. Well, sure, recently we've lived longer because we've accumulated more knowledge. We can, we've learned how to put that knowledge together and spread it out of how to keep alive longer and particularly how to stay alive despite the declining quality of our DNA that, that's happened. Um, scientifically, we know that doesn't strengthen us. It just gives us more time <laughs> for the weaker traits that we have to multiply. You know, a lot of babies used to die and, you know, very quickly from disease and, and all, well, they don't anymore. You know, we've learned how to keep them alive. Well, they still have those same traits and, you know, they grow up, they become adults, they multiply and those traits continue to bring the, the overall DNA downhill. I told you it was a rabbit trail, didn't I? <laughs> but, um, you know, it'll, it'll catch up with us. Um, in the United States, I checked a chart yesterday and it showed the life expectancy in the United States has actually declined in five of the last eight years. Now they're saying, oh, it'll go back up again. I don't know, you know, we just had this COVID-19. That did not include the, the effects of COVID-19. And so, um, you know, we look back in time, there have been projects of incredible size, uh, amazing engineering and brain power and strength that had, had to accomplish that. Um, I can't imagine the teenagers of today building such sites as the pyramids in Egypt or Mexico, you know, engineering that all out or, or the huge statues on Easter Island that they've discovered or, um, you know, the, the chronology and, and the timetable that Stonehenge gives and those, those huge rocks there. You know, researchers have theories as to what may have happened or we think we, they may have done it this way or that way. Um, and, and some of them just give up and say, must have been aliens. Because <laughs> these people, they didn't know what to do back then. No, these people knew a lot more than we do. Um, and, and their abilities were. But I'm gonna give an end to that rabbit trail, okay? Just to help you get that, that mindset, to understand that we need to give more credit to people in Jesus' day than sometimes that we do. They were likely stronger, healthier, sometimes more talented, definitely had better memories, and in some, some ways were much smarter than we are today. And we'll see as we continue, but a good start is that thousands of them at the same time were looking for Jesus. Okay, they were looking for Jesus. Let's continue. Verse 23. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. Now, I like this verse. They're remembering who provided for them and that the Lord had given thanks. Jesus had given thanks for the little bit of food he had, that they had for this big crowd. He didn't complain. Oh, there's not enough food here. He trusted his heavenly father to provide for the people that were there. Do you ever look back, look at a stack of bills? I know that doesn't happen to you, but sometimes I've done this. Just look at a stack of bills and wonder, where's the money gonna come from to pay this? Um, or you look at the things that you really need to be bought or, or to repair or fix things, and, and you kind of feel your spirit fall within you just a little bit and wondering, how's this gonna be met? Um, probably I've done that too much. Uh, these folks, remember Jesus' solution. I think for us, that's good too. First, he gave thanks for what he had, and then he trusted his father to take care of all of it. Um, by the way, this is the first time in the Gospel of John where he refers to Jesus as Lord. And of course, Lord is the title of, you know, you are my master, I will follow you, I'll do what you say. And so, you know, in, in wanting to follow Jesus as Lord, our life lesson now is, when you are wondering how your needs will be met, first, Remember to give thanks for what you already have and trust your Heavenly Father to meet your needs. When you are wondering how your needs are going to be met, first remember to give thanks for what you already have and trust your Heavenly Father to meet your needs. Now, coming back to our narrative, 
verse 23, the people are looking all over the place for Jesus. They've come up empty handed. They can't find Jesus. They can't find his disciples either. Um, their GPS wasn't working apparently. I don't know. <laughs> apparently they've, uh, they, and, and honestly, in the scriptures, I've kind of lost track. I don't know exactly where his path went after he uh, you know, came to shore. And the last teaching is that they came to shore immediately after the storm was calmed. Uh, but we're not sure exactly where he went. So let's go to verse 24. It says, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, brothers and sisters, this, this was not just a three-minute event going on here. It's like, oh, he's not there, he's not there, he's not there. This probably was at least half a day, maybe an all-day adventure. People had to either get in boats and travel across the sea uh, several miles to get there, uh, multiple boats, there's a lot of people, uh, or they had to walk around the Sea of Galilee. There's a uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot of rough terrain around there. When they didn't find them in one place, they'd start checking in another. They're probably asking the people they came across, uh, have you seen the Messiah? You know, where did he go? Where, what path did he take? Did, did, you, did they say where they were going? Were there others with them? Um, you know, they couldn't phone ahead or, or just check to text, hey, have you seen Jesus lately? You know, <laughs> you, you can't, can't do that. They didn't do that. They didn't have Google Maps or Facebook pages to show where he was going to be teaching next. And, you know, they remember that Jesus was always teaching in synagogues when he could. And so they were probably checking those out too, checking there, see if he's there. Um, so they finally thought, well, he, you know, he teaches a lot in Capernaum. So they went that direction and sure enough, got in their boats. They ended up at the north end of the Sea of Galilee and they did find him there. Now, today we can look and say, well, they should have just read verse 59. If you go down to verse 59, it says, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum, right? They should have just opened their Bible. Oh, wait, they didn't have a copy of John there. But they did find him, they got his attention, and they asked when he'd come. Now, they tired themselves out looking, traveling, trying to find the Messiah who had fed them uh, the day before. And our life lesson for us is, when you don't immediately find God in your situation, keep looking. He is there. He is always there. When you don't immediately find God in your situation, keep looking. He is there and he is always there. Now they did ask him when he came. Most likely they were expecting some kind of supernatural explanation and another miraculous sign of overcoming limits of time and space. Um, but he didn't even tell them, well, I just walked across the water. He didn't even tell them that. He just kind of... Let that question go by. As we read so many times in the gospel, Jesus kind of cut through this ball talk and got down to the heart of the matter. And in verse 26, he says, it says, Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Uh-oh, <laughs> they've been caught. Uh, <laughs> they worked so hard to find Jesus why? Because they wanted another meal. Um, you know, we, we would hope that they were seeking the heart of this Messiah, the God-given Messiah. But, uh, you know, they just wanted food again at this point. Remember, we talked a couple of studies back about how normal people didn't have food stored up ahead of time. They went out to work each day. A normal person uh, would go out to work each day and hopefully get enough gain or you know, gather enough food or get enough uh, money to buy food that they could eat for that day. And you know, hence the, the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, was a, a real prayer. It wasn't just something they said. Uh, they, want, they needed food for each day. But it seemed that much of their day, this day had been spent trying to get a free meal from Jesus. That's why they were looking for him. And he knew it, he caught them. Um, you know, we would have done the same. Don't, don't look bad at them. <laughs> we would have done the exact same thing. And they did work. They did some rowing of boats. They did a lot of walking. They were checking places out, trying to find Jesus and the disciples. But remember that the act the day before 
of Jesus feeding over 5,000 people, 5,000 men plus women and children. That was not something he did just to show off. It's not something they, he did because they asked him. Nobody asked him for food. He's the one that told the disciples, you give them food. They're hungry. It was an act of love and compassion that Jesus had on this huge crowd of people that had spent the entire day listening to the very words of God from the lips of Jesus. They were people that were seeking God. They were learning about the kingdom of God. They were finding out how God wanted to work in their lives, words they had never heard before. Um, they, went, were, they were trying to find what God had for them. And you know, you think now, had they forgotten all that and they were just hoping for a free meal? No, well, maybe a little bit. They probably remembered back. You know, had such a thing happened before? Well, yes, it had. Here's your homework for today is, you know, jot down Exodus 16. In Exodus 16, I'm going to read a little bit of that, a few verses, but I encourage you to read the entire account because this is where the children of Israel had come out of Egypt and now they're afraid they're going to starve to death. They're complaining. You know, oh, you know, we had food back in Egypt. We had to work all day and all night, and seven days a week, 375 days a year, even though it's only 365 days in a year, probably 360 at that point. But anyway, um, verses uh, 11 to 15 say, And the Lord spoke to Moses, to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up in the evening and covered the camp. And in the, dew, in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted... There on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And I'm going to jump to verse 31. And the house of Israel called its name manna. And it was like white coriander seed. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And then verse 35, And the children of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Any of y'all eat coriander seeds? You ever see those? I, I, <laughs> I asked Mitzi, is there anything in your spice cabinet? Sure enough, they had little coriander seeds, little, little tiny little pebbles. And it's like, oh, that makes sense. It's what it looked like, a little frost on the ground. Just all these little seeds out there, and, and they ate it. But I'll tell you what, it did not taste like a wafer made with honey when I ate it yesterday. <laughs> but God put a special flavoring in there, and he just basically said, this is your bread. I'm guessing they could probably pack it together and eat it. They, uh, but God knew, they knew that God had provided manna for, in the wilderness every day for their ancestors. Uh, they maybe thought it was going to happen again, this, this miraculous guy. Keep this, guy, this in mind because we're going to visit it again next week's teaching. But the thought of Manda, <laughs> it reminds me of uh, when Mitzi and I were in having lunch in high schools. Uh, <laughs> the high school we attended. Uh, back then they weren't big buffets like, like they have in colleges now. Um, I mean, you went through the line and they put food on your tray. And sometimes it was literally unrecognizable. And if any of my old cooks, my, my teachers or cooks are watching, yes, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I asked my friends at the table that had been there for, you know, longer than I had at that school, and I'd say, what is it? And they say, it's manna. Well, since it was a Christian school, I figured that was kind of some kind of code word for some kind of special food they'd have from time to time. Made it a certain way. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I realized that when I asked something, it wasn't the same every time that they'd say it's manna. And I was like, what's, what's the deal with that? Let me in on the secret. They say, manna. It, it literally means, what is it? And that's what we all say. We don't know what it is. We just eat it. <laughs> and so the children of Israel ate it. Uh, Forty years, it kept them alive. So that was, um, I, I just had to accept uh, that like Exodus says, this is the bread, this is the food which the Lord has given us to eat. I just hoped that I wouldn't have to eat that for 40 more years, okay? <laughs> but the children of Israel did. But our life lesson for us today is whatever the Lord gives us, it will sustain us and will give us strength that we need for the day. 
Whatever the Lord gives us, it will sustain us and will give us strength that we need for today. Now, back into our, our narrative, Jesus knew they had hoped for manna, this food from heaven, and that's why they worked so hard to find Jesus that day. But they were the same people. You know, they had changed. They were the same people that had initially been so hungry for God's word the day before that they stood there all day listening to him teaching. In fact, I knew they were standing all day because when it came time to eat, Jesus had to tell the disciples, make them sit down. Make them sit down. They were standing. They were pushing. They were trying to get closer to him to hear more of what God had to say. And so these were people that were literally wanting to learn more about God. And um, they were willing to hear Jesus. They wanted, And Jesus wanted to take advantage of this teachable moment. So instead of carrying on and, and talking more about, you know, about them, uh, you know, wanting food, had a, having motos they only wanted to eat. He just turned it very quickly and said, do not labor, verse 27, do not labor for food, for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Now this verse can be rather convicting, so let's just move on to verse 28, okay? Uh, Can we skip that? <laughs> no, we don't do that. But I'm going to dig in a little deeper on this one. Maybe I'll read it in the Amplified. Maybe it means something different. It says, Stop toiling and doing and producing for the food that perishes and decomposes in the using, but strive and work and produce rather for the lasting food which endures continually unto eternal life, into life eternal. The Son of Man will give you, furnish you that, for God the Father has authorized and certified him and put his seal of endorsement upon him. I love the Amplified. I mean, it just brings it all in there together. But once, once again, Jesus is making a contrast, as we had seen him do a, a few teachings ago, um, a contrast between the material things and spiritual things. Material food, in fact, and spiritual food. Uh, it's almost universal that we are, as people are, more attracted to material things than we are to spiritual things. I mean, just think, if you went to a, a fork in a road, and up here on the road it had, you know, on this side it said free food and free money, and on this side it said spiritual help. I mean, even as believers, which one would you tend to want to go towards more? Most people are going to go for the free food, free money. Uh, rather than the spiritual fulfillment and eternal life. Um, yet, the way Jesus says this in this, this passage is a way that makes it very easy for people to understand. It's like asking, do you want to work for something that disappears? Or do you want to work for something that literally will last forever? Okay, when you put it that way, what's your choice? <laughs> you know, it's the same effort, just different results. And you get to choose which one you, you do. And please don't, don't get mixed up here. Um, Jesus is not telling us here that we have to labor for eternal life, that we have to work to get eternal life. We have to work to get to heaven. That is not the point here at all. No, it's for the, the food or the fruit that endures to eternal life. Now, how can that be? How does eternal food come from the work of someone who is temporary? I mean, we, we only last a certain number of years here. Um, as I get older, I see more and more friends that I have that are dropping like flies sometimes. I'm sorry to put it that way, but I mean, they're, they're passing on to the next world. And, um, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to continue to eat. But Jesus answers that, and he says in that verse, The Son of Man will give, furnish you that, for the God the Father has authorized and certified him, and put his seal of endorsement upon him. So a life lesson for us in this is that, Jesus is the one that gives you the gift of everlasting life. And when you labor for him, he also provides more eternal benefits and blessings. Jesus is the one that gives you the gift of everlasting life. And when you labor for him, he also provides more eternal benefits and blessings. Well, we don't, well, well we, we do know some of the fruits of our labors. We see some of the results here on earth and we we also know that as we share God's word with people uh, and lead them and uh, witness to, to folks, that uh, we, all, we see them gain eternal life. Um, but sometimes we just don't know what God has in store for us over eternity. Um, 
the, the scriptures do have a few places where they, they kind of hint at some of the rewards that are etern uh, in, et in eternity for us. And don't tell me that you don't want to work for rewards, okay? Everybody wants to work for rewards. <laughs> don't be too spiritual on me here, okay? Grace upon grace, blessings upon blessings. We, we studied that a few weeks back. Trust, we trust God to provide what he knows is best. Something else I notice in this, uh, this verse is that he refers to himself as the Son of Man and not the Messiah. Now, he's not denying that he's the Messiah, but he's using more of a spiritual term that, than, than one that might stir up political ambitions to the people he's talking to. I mean, just remember, <laughs> Jesus isn't trying to overthrow the king. But yesterday, in this narrative, the people were about to force him to become king. They want to take him and make him king. And he's like, no, that's not what I'm here for. I have a different kingdom. I have a much greater kingdom that you don't know anything about. And I'm trying to teach you how that works. And so he refers to himself as the son of man, which they knew in that culture and in, in the, the background they had, they knew that really meant the son of God, that he was God's offspring. Now, Something else in the last chapter we read, Jesus talked extensively about the Father had granted him, had granted the Son the authority to give life, both in the flesh and also for eternity. That he was going to raise people from the dead, both in the flesh and also unto eternal life. Um, and then he, the scripture here also talks about this God's seal of endorsement upon him. And the seal of the Father was put on him by his baptism and also by performing the signs and also through the scriptures that spoke of Jesus. So there's multiple seals of endorsement. Again, we covered that uh, in chapter 5. Um, we can look back to his baptism and recorded it, as recorded in Mark chapter 1. As one of those signs, verses 9 to 11 in Mark 1. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting. And the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That's a pretty good endorsement. Okay? <laughs> uh, I haven't seen that yet. But I'm going to visit baptism for just a moment here. And, and we know from many scriptures that it's not the act of being baptized that brings a person to salvation. We are saved or justified by faith in Christ. It's not the works that we do. And baptism is a work. It's not the works that we do that brings us salvation. The good works that we do are a result of the faith of Christ, faith in Christ bringing us salvation, not the other way around. And we've heard it said that being baptized, uh, I've heard this and it's good, good saying, being baptized is an outward sign, an outward and public sign of an inward work that God has done in our lives. And that's true. But here I'm seeing maybe there's something special. Maybe there's a special blessing. Maybe there's an extra seal of God, a little stamp of approval upon, from, from God upon those who actually do good works. And that the good work of baptism is not only results in a public witness, which is great, but it's also a two-way street. We know Jesus had no sin. He didn't need to repent. Uh, yet he insisted that John baptize him. We see in our text, Jesus refers back to his baptism as a time when God put his seal upon him. The Amplified, I like the way they say they call it, calls it an endorsement or certification. Um, I've seen hundreds of people, and I've seen a lot of people right out here behind us here, jump in a pool and come back up out of the water. Y'all seen that too, probably. Um, they're not the same as baptism. <laughs> I've seen hundreds of people be baptized, go under the water and come back out of the water. And there's something so special. There's something special every time that that happens. I haven't heard a voice from heaven in any of those, but it's, it's special on each one of those times. And um, if y'all need to be baptized, you know, let me know and we'll figure out some way to make that happen. Uh, we know we got a couple of our folks here that are going to be baptized in a couple of weeks. So uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank you for closing the door. Appreciate that. <laughs> But, you know, the, it's not a one-way transaction. It's the believer saying, I'm obediently following Jesus Christ for all the world to see. And God, on the other hand, is putting a stamp of approval on his child as a reward and a sign for others. And the believer is filled with joy. So our life lesson here is that obedience to Christ is a sign to the believer 
and to those around that Christ has given him or her eternal life. Obedience to Christ is a sign to the believer and to those around that Christ has given him or her eternal life. Now, at this point, I'm pretty impressed by the crowd around Jesus. I mean, they seem to be understanding that the spiritual was more important as a physical. And we see in verse 28, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Maybe they're starting to get it. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, when I hire somebody to do work for me, the, the only thing I want them asking me, to, me is, what can I do to do the work you need me to do? You know? <laughs> and so I don't need them to ask me, what time do I get off? <laughs> you know, when am I going to get a raise? You haven't worked yet. You're not getting a raise. You know? <laughs> but but you know, without getting all Greeky on you, I want to say there are several words in the Greek um, for work. And the word that Jesus used when he told them to labor not for the perishable uh, was ergozomai. Probably didn't even say it right. But that was the word... Uh, he used and when the people asked Jesus this question they were repeating the same word for work back to him so they're saying what can we do to physically do the physical labors for God the answer to the question is actually given a number of times in scriptures and it depends upon the spirit in which it was asked that's one of the things and also um, who was asking the question in the Hebrew scriptures Hosea 6 6 says for I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, a little bit earlier in, uh, in Luke, when John the baptizer was still alive, he was specific to specific groups. In Luke chapter 3, it says, So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to those who has none, have none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors came to be baptized. And he said to them, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed of you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. So, you know, the Spirit of God in John the Baptist even, you know, gave, gave people these answers. And John the Baptist was just such an awesome guy. <laughs> I would have loved to have heard more of his teachings. Uh, uh, looking forward to heaven when we can you know, chat with them a little while. But, you know, I'm, I'm a trusting person. Uh, I'd like to think that these people are really understanding the spiritual aspect of Jesus' teaching. But I've got to tell you, with such a large crowd here, there probably were multiple possibilities. Uh, there's probably most likely a mix. In one sense, they could have been meaning, just tell us what you need us to do so that we can get what we want from you. Um, we want your miracle we want your bread. We want you to be our miracle king. So just tell us how we get there. You know, we tried yesterday and you wouldn't let us make you king. Let's try it again. What do we have to do? We still see some of that lingering this week. Uh, and some of them may have been sure that if Jesus just told them what to do, they could actually please God by doing the works of God. Perhaps these people, along with many today, thought that pleasing God is found in the right formula. You know, here's the five-step process for performing works that will please God. I love the answer Jesus gave here because it actually works no matter what the thoughts or intents of the heart of the people that he, he's talking to, whether it is on that, uh, in Capernaum in that synagogue where they're asking him or whether it's on the hillside in, in Palestine or whether it's in Harrison Hall at Forest Lake Campground. Verse 29 says, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. God does the work. You just believe and trust in, cling to, rely on, be committed to the one that God sent. That is, believe in the one that was standing in front of them. Believe in Jesus. Jesus first and foremost commanded them and us not to do, not to physically labor, but to trust in Him. If we want to do the work of God, it begins and ends. <laughs> and a lot in between, it begins with trusting Jesus. You know, a parent not only wants obedience from their child, a relationship of love and trust is much more important to the parent. 
The hope is that obedience will grow out of that relationship of love and trust. And God wants the same pattern in our, our relationship with him. The first work is to believe on the one that he sent. Yet God is concerned about our obedience. In this sense, our faith is not a substitute for works. Our faith is the foundation for the works that truly please God. Could it be that there's not truly really a tremendous difference between the work, the labor done by a believer, and trusting in Jesus and the work that's done through God? Now, one writer puts it this way. He says, the priest says, rites and ceremonies. The thinker says, culture, education. The moralist says, do this, do that, do the other thing, and then gives a whole series of separate acts. But what does Jesus say? Jesus Christ says, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Our life lesson here is, you have one job, believe in Jesus. You have one job, believe in Jesus. We are so blessed today to have these accounts in scripture and not only the account from the gospel, but also the writings of those who followed Jesus and who the Holy Spirit spoke through to expand on the practical teachings as the believers in Christ began putting their faith into action and depending on the Holy Spirit to lead them in the first century. It's great to study the Gospels, especially how they all fit together into the Hebrew Scriptures and, and how Jesus fulfilled and explained how God's Word comes alive in our lives. And then we see how Jesus' teachings are applied to our lives and to our church congregations in the New Testament. I mean, the Scriptures run the whole gamut of application of Christ's teachings uh, through times of great persecution, in times of freedom, and in uncertain times like we are in today. It shows us how to respond when we're in great need or sometimes in super abundance. It gives us instruction, encouragement, and explanation when all is wonderfully grand and our health is just top of the line. And it also it explains how sufferings sometimes can even be better for us and for the kingdom. Now, I really love this study in John we've been doing, and, and I'm learning more, and I hope you all are following this and share it with others. But don't limit yourself to just one line of study. Keep reading the other passages in the scriptures, various sections of the Bibles that helps us keep understanding how all of it works together. Now, next week, we'll see even more of this teaching from Jesus and, and how more questions from the people uh, fit together. There are more parallels to the Hebrew scriptures and some pretty exciting truths about Jesus' relationship with us. But for now, what is your response to Jesus? Do you believe? Are you committed to? Do you fully rely on, cling to, and trust in Jesus? I certainly hope so. If God is speaking to you to renew your relationship with Jesus, or maybe you've never fully trusted in Christ, today can be your day. Simply agree with him that you are a sinner, that you've not put God first in your life and that you want to trust him from this day forward. Ask him to forgive all of your sin, to give you his power to live for God from this day forward. Then study the Bible, God's word, and follow him. You can be assured that he will do as he promised in his word. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now remember, we don't have to clean ourselves up to take a bath. That's a little backwards, right? Now in the same way, it is Jesus that is faithful and will work to clean us up after our sins are forgiven. Our part, let him forgive you now. Let him clean up your life for his good works. Now I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's word as we conclude. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you for being with us. God bless you.